Welcome to CARICOM Matters. I'm Miles Eversley. Thanks for joining us. In our last program, we discussed the origin and rationale behind the Bridgetown Initiative, as well as its first component. Since then, and as you are aware, Prime Minister Motley made an address at COP27 held in Egypt. Special envoy to the Prime Minister of Barbados on Investment and Financial Services, Professor Avinash Prasad, joined the discussion virtually as he attended the conference. He expounds on the need to normalize the use of natural disaster and pandemic clauses in debt instruments, one of many points made by Prime Minister Motley in her address. One of the challenges we have as developing countries is that when, when a disaster happens, we have a few options. We have to spend money to deal with the disaster. Um, when, when, when you're lucky like us, we, you know, we, we had dealt with our debt to a debt restructuring. So when COVID happened, there was never a big debate about what we had to do. We had to build a new hospital. We had to find vaccines, find ventilators. Um, and it was like, whatever it costs, we have to do it because we have to save lives. When you're poor, you, you know, some of these choices become more and more difficult and there are less and less options. And so you tend to have a lot of debt. And when you're in that stressful situation, you have few options. So when we were doing our debt restructuring, our advisors, White Oak, recommended to us that we should put some natural disaster clauses in our bonds. So we weren't very sure about what these things were. We listened to them and we thought, oh, actually, this sounds very good. <laughs> and what they were, and they, they had experimented with them in Grenada. Grenada was the first country in the world, so another Caribbean country, the first country in the world to put natural disaster clauses in their debt. We are the world's largest issuer of them now, but Grenada was the first. Now, what happens with these clauses? It says that if an independent entity, so not ourselves, declares that a national disaster has taken place, we can stop servicing our bonds. So no interest, principal repayment for two years. Those two years of suspended payments are added on at the end of the term of the loan and paid back then. So from the position of a creditor, the creditor ends up getting all of the income they would have come got. And when there was a gap, they get, that, they get, the in, they get interest paid on that. So the creditor, the person who's lent you the money, is no worse off. The borrower now, they suddenly get a lot of space and time and liquidity when they need it most. And one of the things we've argued is uh, repeatedly. Now, now we have them. So we weren't arguing for ourselves. We were saying, look, we've got them and we think they're really good and we think it will transform the world if everyone else had them. Now, that is of some benefit to us because if everyone else has them, then people won't view our death as being a bit odd, <laughs> a bit unusual, uh, and it's good to normalize them. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the arguments we had is, is that if every developing country in the world had our natural disaster clauses, and we call them Barbados style natural disaster clauses, they would have, they would have saved them $1 trillion during COVID. They could have diverted all this money they would have spent on paying interest and paying back debt into the health uh, crisis. They could have built hospitals and bought vaccines and, and bought treatment and, and, and care and ventilators and, uh, and all the equipment they needed. They didn't have the money. They only, the entire developing world only spent uh, 500 billion, half a trillion. Our clauses could have tripled the amount they spent. So yes, it makes a lot of sense. President Macron likes it, but you know what? Other people are getting on board. And this is perhaps our first victory uh, in the sense that the UK Export Credit Agency invited me to a meeting at the COP conference here in Egypt, where they announced and unveiled that they will issue in all of their loan agreements, natural disaster clauses. Um, I'm not sure they're as good as our natural disaster clauses, but they are natural disaster clauses that suspend debt service payments uh, for a period of time not as long as ours, ours are two years, I think theirs are one year. Um, but the point is that momentum is growing. So sometimes people say, oh, you know, what are you doing on the international stage? These things make a difference. A difference being made, yes. Now, Ambassador Komishong continues the discussion with the second component of the Bridgetown Initiative. 
after we deal with the, the current emergency debt crisis, the Bridgestone Initiative now focuses on revamping these international financial institutions and reconfiguring their priorities and the scale at which they attend to these priorities. So, step two. Step two says, look, the world has to be committed to the notion of a global public commons. The notion that um, there are some things that are so important to human survival and that are so common to, to the entire humanity that they could be conceived of as something that we all share in common, a global public common. So for, to give an example, um, COVID-19 has taught us that the whole world needs a public an international public health, health system. Because if a virus um, emerges, a virus or some contagious disease emerges in a particular country, it is not going to stop at the borders of that country. So it is in the interest of the entire globe to make sure that the entire world has access to a good public health system that we could save the world from outbreaks of, of contagious diseases, um, for example, or we can respond. The entire globe has the capacity to, to respond. The climate crisis, that's another, <laughs> that's another um, global um, public common. We all are involved in this climate crisis. So, it, it, you know, so we can't say, well, Okay, if this country wants to continue to pollute, let them, uh, or, or not to make a transition to low carbon, let them, let them um, do so. It will only affect them. No, it's going to affect all of us. So, so if we think of um, global public commons, we think of, we think of building um, defenses to the climate crisis. We think of public health, global public health. We think of global education, a global education system so that all over the world, people have access to, to, to education because if, you know, um, lack of education, lack of hope in any one country, among any one people becomes a threat to the, um, the entire order. We think of the environment, not just climate, but the land and the oceans the preservation of the land and the, and the oceans. That's another um, global public, public common. Access to the internet. That should be seen as a right for, for all, um, all humanity. Access to the financial system. That should be seen as a global right of all humanity. So the, the um, Bridgetown Initiative is saying, and the Bridgetown Initiative is identifying that we must have this commitment to um, the global public commons, and it is linking the concept of the global public commons to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These are the goals that the world came together in 2015 um, under the umbrella of the United Nations and said that by 2030, what we are aiming for get rid of hunger, establish proper education system for all people in the world, proper health care system for all people in the world, proper um, access to, port to, to portable water for all people. So this coheres with the concept of the global um, public common. And the Bridgetown Initiative is saying that the financial institutions need to step up their game to provide the funding that is necessary to assist developing countries to meet these sustainable development goals, to be, to, to be able to finance them successfully, to do them. And, 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 and if, you, if you help the developing countries to attain these sustainable developing goals, what you are in fact doing 
is that you are preserving the global public commons. So we all, whether we are developing countries or developed countries, we should all have, we all have a vested interest in providing the financing necessary for developing countries to attain these goals. So in order to accomplish these goals, to overcome the challenges hindering the progress of developing countries, the Bridgetown Initiative argues for multilateral lending to be expanded. We question Professor Prasad as to whether multilateral development banks were fit to assist developing states facing 21st century challenges. So firstly, let, let's help your audience uh, think through what we're talking about. So multilateral is, um, is, is, is development banks with lots of countries behind them, as opposed to a national development bank. Um, remember, we used to have a national development bank, uh, uh, and this is uh, the World Bank, for example, where there are 100 or so shareholders. They were set up in 1948 as part of the post-war uh, settlement after the war to try and develop the world together so that we would have less wars and conflict. It seems that when people are, at, before you become a development banker, uh, you tend to be a, a development uh, writer, thinker, uh, um, researcher, and you're all for development. And then they give you an appointment at the development bank and you suddenly become a hard-nosed banker and you say, ooh, I don't know if you're, if you're fit for me to lend you money. So they're very difficult to lend. They, they, and there's been a recent report by the G20 governments, no less, so, so not just borrowers, who said they can lend a lot more than they currently do with the money they've got. They don't need more money to lend more. They're being too conservative. They can lend, in fact, one trillion dollars more now uh, for the whole world. Uh, and that's based on doing three things. And that's without anyone giving them any more money. They, they need to use the existing money they have more aggressively. They need to um, accept what's called donor guarantee. So America, Britain, and other countries can write a piece of paper that says, if the World Bank goes bust, we will come in and um, help to rescue it. And that piece of paper actually allows the World Bank to go and borrow money cheaply. Because they can say to the lender, the person lending them money, they can say, look, you know, we're not, you're going to be paid back. If there's a problem, Britain has signed this thing. But it doesn't mean that Britain has to put any money into it. It's, it's called... Um, callable is real capital real money or this callable capital that you call when you need it and if they use some callable capital plus the existing capital they've got they can lend almost a trillion dollars and some other things they have to do so that's now you asked are they fit if they do that they could probably triple the amount they lend every year uh, and it'll take them from, from around lending Seventy billion dollars every year to about two hundred billion dollars a year, and then you said, you know, can they do that? Well, on paper they can do that. The shareholders want them to do that, but you don't. You don't um, point the most aggressive entrepreneurial person to be your banker. So we've been saying, okay, you can't expect the multilateral development banks to reform themselves. You can't wait for them to reform themselves. The, the shareholders, the people who put up most money for those banks to exist, they need to really push it more aggressively. And you know, I think it's one of the Bridgetown Initiative proposals that I think is going very far. Macron, you mentioned Macron earlier. President Macron did something that we hadn't said. He said, I love this Bridgetown Initiative. And you know what? We need to make it a, a April of 2023 initiative. Now, I think he's being a bit aggressive. Let's say it's a 2023 initiative, but he said, you know, let's not wait till the end of 2023. Let's go earlier. And this is one of those things that could happen earlier. Momentum is building. Now, the final component of the agenda focuses on funding the battle against the climate crisis. 
More specifically, it mentions the development of a new mechanism to provide reconstruction grants for loss and damage sustained by developing countries from climate disasters. Ambassador Komishong details this. This is probably, this might be the most um, ambitious, um, but uh, the most critical part of the Bridgetown Initiative because it is targeting an issue um, that if not addressed, could destroy our world, destroy our civilization, climate, the climate crisis, global warming. And it, it is recognizing a couple of things. It is recognizing that if the world is going to be able to do what is necessary to keep the global warming below 1.5 a 1.5 degree increase by the end of this century that we are going to have to, to massively scale up um, what we are doing now because what we are doing now is nowhere close to achieving um, that objective so there ha there's going to have to be a massive scaling up of our efforts it is also based on a recognition that Developing countries, for the most part, did not cause the climate crisis. We were not responsible for generating the global warming. Yet, we are on the front line of the climate crisis. We are being impacted by the climate crisis. We are being forced to spend a lot of our money uh, on responding to the climate crisis as opposed to spending it on achieving the sustainable development goals. Uh, in, many, in many cases, we, you know, we don't have a choice. You're hit by a hurricane. You have to spend the money on rebuilding after the hurricane. Well, if you're spending the money on rebuilding after the hurricane, or if you're spending the money on dealing with sargassum, or dealing with droughts, or dealing with... Um, salt water coming into your aquifers and you need to to build desalination plants and all of that then you don't have the money to spend on education and 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 health and um access to broadband and um renewable energy so the bridgetown initiative says look we need a new approach to dealing with all of this. First of all, we need a, a new international mechanism that will be financed to the tune of not less than um, US $650 billion in IMF special drawing rights. And this new mechanism and I've seen it referred to as a global um, climate mitigation um, trust. The idea is that this mechanism with that kind of finance at its disposal will do a couple things. One, it will be in a position where if a country is hit by a climate disaster, a hurricane, for example, like how... Um, the Bahamas was hit, you know, like, like how Barbados was hit um, last year, that that country should be given grants to respond to that disaster and to rebuild. So it is calling for reconstruction grants to be made available to especially developing countries that did not create the climate crisis but are then being impacted by climate disasters. They should not have to look to borrow money and they should be given grants to reconstruct. Prime Minister Motley made mention of the necessity to address urgently the issue of loss and damage grant funding during her remarks at COP27. We believe that it is critical that we address the issue of loss and damage. The talk must come to an end. And I'd like to salute Denmark and Belgium and Scotland for their own modest ways of trying to accept the precepts and principles of loss and damage as critical and as morally just. 
Professor Prasad proceeds to provide us with his perspective. When a, a country gets hit like a hurricane, a, a classic example for us is the 2017, although we, we had hurricane also. Um, uh, it, it wasn't as damaging, say, as Hurricane uh, Maria in Dominica. Maria wiped out 226% of GDP. So that's all 200% of the national income of, of Dominica was wiped out in four hours. Houses, almost every single house either was damaged in some way. So you need to rebuild. And there's some communities that you just have to work out, well, that isn't the place for them to rebuild. All the solar panels smashed, all the powers um, for, uh, for whether it's water or, or, or uh, cell phones, all that smashed, needs to be rebuilt. Now, they're having to rebuild because of an event that's been caused by the rich countries polluting the atmosphere. So the argument has been they shouldn't be using their money to rebuild. This was an event that wasn't caused by them. It's as if someone crashed into your car and is saying, well, you know, eh, sorry, <laughs> but you've got to pay for it. And what the world is, what the, the, the poor countries are saying, you've smashed into my car. You need to make a contribution. Now, where I think Bridgetown comes in and is helping to break the, the deadlock is that the developing world's position was a little bit uncompromising. Both, both people had uncompromising positions. We've been in a deadlock for 27 years for, for a reason, not, not for no reason. The, the developing countries have said, um, we need money in grant form for loss and damage, and you need to pay for us to adapt, and you need to pay for us to transform, and you need to pay for all the history and culture that you, we, we've lost, uh, and you need to pay for this, and you need to pay for that. Um, and the rich countries are thinking, oh, my Lord, this is, this, this is never-ending. Um, and it's also to foreigners, and, you know, no one likes paying, uh, no, no taxpayer likes to put money even to their own people, far less foreigners. And so they've been saying, no, nothing. So we've been saying we want everything, and they've been saying, no, nothing. So Bridgetown comes to the middle and says, you know, we do need money for reconstruction. It does need to be cash. It can't be loans. You know, when you be, everything's been destroyed, you're adding more debt onto a destroyed economy. That, that's going to cause us to go into a debt crisis. So we do need cash. It does need to be after a disaster, and it needs to be for reconstruction. So we're saying if you limit it to cash and reconstruction after an event, then we're not going to be asking for everything. Can you pay for that? And we know that you can't sign a check. So let's put a levy on the people who produce fossil fuels. Let's put a levy on the profits of fossil fuel companies or the revenues of fossil fuel companies. Um, and so that's what we've proposed. Um, and because the cost of living is already high, I mean, you see the price of the petrol tank. Uh, uh, are, are people saying to raise that even further? So we're saying, no, look, Petrol prices are already very high today, but they're about 30 to 40 percent more expensive than they were before the Russian invasion, before COVID. So every 10 percentage points in which they fall back towards normal, put one of that 10 into a fund for loss and damage and let consumers keep nine. The next 10, put one into loss and damage, let consumers keep nine. And if we do that, we'll end up with two or three percentage points every year going to a loss and damage fund, raising the $200 billion the world needs. So when Pakistan has that problem or Dominica has that problem, there's a fund that can help them quickly. The component also proposes the leveraging of special drawing rights to encourage private investment in low carbon transition. Ambassador Komishong continues with this point. It is saying that this new mechanism needs to use that 650 billion um, US in special drawing rights and leverage it to encourage and energize um, and mobilize private sector savings and investment all over the world to direct um, those savings and investment towards 
um, projects that would be aimed at transitioning to low carbon economies and societies. This is what the world desperately needs now. If the world is to hold down the um, increase in, in the global temperature to below 1.5 degrees increase, it needs now all across the world um, countries doing all kinds of things to transition to low carbon economies and societies. And that is going to call for massive, massive new spending and investment. How do you, how do you encourage um, private businesses, um, international ba banks and international banks, how do you encourage them to devote their resources and their energy <laughs> towards those kinds of, of projects. So it is saying that if you have, if you set up this new global institution that is going to use this 650 billion um, special drawing rights to, to, to be the carrot, to persuade, to make, it, to make it palatable, you know, to guarantee this investment, to encourage this investment, that that is what you need. And then thirdly, um, it is saying that um, it is recognizing that many developing countries that need to, to, to do projects to transition to low carbon, they're so indebted that they just can't, even with the best will in the world, they, 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 they cannot take on new debt to do these things. So it is saying that this new institution not only can it, should it be able to make concessionary loans available to develop highly indebted developing countries, but it should be able to do so in a way where this new debt does not go on to the national balance sheet of the already highly indebted um, developing country. So you're talking about, in a sense, a, a global balance sheet from which countries can engage in this borrowing and, um, and, and, and spending, um, but it does not go on to the national balance sheet um, such that it, compromise, it compromises an already um, heavily indebted um, developing country. So that basically is the, the configuration of the Bridgetown Initiative. And it all fits together as a package. So each of the components reinforces the other one. We have developed an agenda that is deliberately achievable, individually uh, items that are achievable, that collectively are very meaningful. And I think that that's, that that's not happened before. And that's why there's so much commotion internationally. All of these things will benefit us. Our natural disaster clauses will be seen as normal. Uh, we are arguing for uh, concessional money for climate vulnerable countries so that we can get some, some low cost money to build our seawalls and our flood defenses. Um, we're arguing for this global mitigation trust that will attract the private sector to invest in more renewable energy and wind power and solar power. Um, but the point is really, it's not about us. It's a point is that it will save the world, it will save the climate. And that will help us. And so we conclude with this, the third and final component of the Bridgetown Initiative. May we continue to push onward with these proposals and reap the benefits of their prospects for our development. We invite you to join us next week as Professor Prasad details the Prime Minister's speech at the COP27 conference. Until next time, I'm Miles Eversley. Do take care and thanks for your time.